Okay. All right, we're going to talk tonight about um, how to clear the mess on your desk. Now, I don't know if you have a mess on your desk, but most people have a mess on their desk. <laughs> uh, whether that's a genealogy mess or some other kind of mess, no judgment, um, but a lot of us have uh, genealogical messes and, and other kinds, kinds of things that we're trying to deal with. I have friends who think that the floor is just the best option. Um, that's where they're gonna put their stuff. <laughs> so uh, many of you probably have similar problems. So I'll introduce myself um, there. What should you know about me? Well, first of all, I love genealogy. So you guys are my people. Uh, and I volunteer as a DNA interest group facilitator for Genetics, Genealogy, and You. And it's an online free uh, DNA interest group. So if you're interested in that, um, you can email me and I can add you to that list. But we meet um, once a month for six or seven different months out of the year. So we don't meet again actually until January. But we talk about all kinds of things DNA. And I know that's not our topic tonight, but I, I always am interested in uh, hearing if anybody has DNA questions. Uh, most of the lines of my family have been in Ohio for almost 190 years. I always love when I can uh, tip that for another decade, um, but it's 190 at this point. Um, and my family is, uh, I live in Columbus, Ohio, so Franklin County, and pretty much everything west of here, all the way to Dark County on the Indiana border. So if you have family in Champaign, Clark, Union, Shelby, any of those counties, Dark County, uh, you might be my people. Um, I also work for a company called Smart Education. Uh, it's in Dubai, which is in the United Arab Emirates, and I work at home in my pajamas. And so it's a great job that gives me the option of doing a lot of things like this that I love to do uh, without impacting on my work day. And yes, I have been to Dubai. I usually get that question at some point. So if you have questions tonight, there's a couple ways we can do that. You can place your questions in the chat. So if you hover near the bottom or one of the sides of your screen, you might see the chat box. Um, the other thing is we'll have time at the end for questions. So are you tired of piles and scraps and sticky notes? <laughs> then you're in the right place. Uh, we're gonna talk about some easy methods to organize your papers and photos and your digital records and your projects and to spend more time on your quest and not looking for what's misplaced. The time that you spend organizing is gonna save you time in the future. So can you relate to this? Uh, I work in educational publishing in the K-12 market and when I worked in an office, which has been almost 20 years now, but when I worked in an office, we had um, a lady in our office and we affectionately called her the sticky note lady and her office looked, I mean, seriously like this. It was kind of crazy, but maybe this is you or maybe this is you or you feel like there's a big avalanche on your head. Um, no worries, we're gonna give you some tips of how to get yourself a little bit more organized. So what I wish I knew when I started, I wish that I knew that I should survey my family and ask questions and bring out photos and try to entice people to tell me what they remember. Um, I wish that I would have known to collect photos and stories and recollections and, and where I found them as I found them. I think most of us as beginning genealogists, we just are collecting things and hoarding things and we're not really thinking about um, where did we find it and how can someone find their way back to where we were. Also, um, consider different organizational methods. You know, I'm going to talk about some tools tonight, but it may not be a good fit for you. So think about the ways that you already organize. So do you already organize for your taxes? Do you already organize for your recipes or for your quilting supplies? Whatever the case may be, try to find something from tonight that's similar to what you do. It's similar to the way your brain works. 
I, I've sat in many different lectures on organization where someone's trying to convince me that their way is the best way. And I'm not here to do that because I think the best way for you to organize is the way that's easier for you to implement and easier for you to remember and easier for you to grab a hold of and run with. So I'm not here to convince you otherwise. But one thing that should be part of any organizational plan is considering how to preserve it and how to distribute it. Those are things that are really important. What's the point of doing all this work to compile information about our families, to learn about all the things that we've learned about regions of the world and we've gone to all these meetings, what's the point if no one ever sees it? So those are all critical things to keep in mind. So I always start with the chart. Now I know this is genealogy 101. So there are a lot of ways you can do charts. You can do charts, paper, pencil. You can do charts digitally. You can do charts in spreadsheets um, and you can do charts with digital trees. So there's a lot of different ways that you can have your pedigree charts or your ancestor charts. Think about how many biological ancestors you have you're going to need a really good organizational system if you are looking at having maybe 128 fifth grade grandparents unless you have pedigree collapse or 256 sixth grade grandparents those are a lot of people to keep track of so the numbers do end up being important and maybe they're motivational for you to uh, get a little bit more organized so I always spend a lot of time at my local library when it's open, which is the Columbus Metropolitan Library. I also live within 10 minutes of the Ohio History Center. So that's another bonus for me. You have local library systems where you live, but I go to my local library even if I don't have Franklin County ancestors I'm researching. We all know that our libraries have collections from other parts of the country and sometimes other parts of the world. One thing that helps with organization and being successful in genealogy is finding a genealogy buddy. Find someone who will hold you accountable. Find someone who's interested in what you're interested in. Most of us have family that aren't that interested. Uh, they're here. They're paying attention sometimes, but they're not necessarily that interested. And we're going to talk later about how your genealogy buddy can help you with preservation. You want to set aside time weekly for organization. So schedule it. Schedule research, but also schedule organization. A lot of people like the hunt and the find, but they forget that they need to really organize what they found and what they hunted for. Otherwise, you're gonna go down that same rabbit trail. I'm sure many of you have done that, where you find something, you get so excited just to realize, oh, I already found that like five years ago. And then what were you doing? <laughs> so we wanna be, uh, we wanna be scheduling organization in the same way that we're scheduling our research time, or at least carve out a little piece for that. So you can do this, determine what needs organizing, choose a methodology, and don't forget citations. When I say determine what needs organizing, there are a lot of things that you can organize. Maybe it starts small. For me, it started with photographs. I have mostly a digital collection because both of my parents are still living. So both of my parents have the actual documents and papers and that sort of thing but what i have is digital scans of almost everything but think about what is it that you want to organize first rather than seeing organization as this huge mountain to overcome think about what is that small thing that i can do today and what is this small thing that i can do moving forward so even if it's just collecting your photos from your phone even if it's just scanning the photos that you have or preserving the photos you have or doing something with documents that you have. There's a number of different ways that you can start, but start small because then you'll feel successful and you'll keep going. So there is some genealogy terminology that comes into play here anytime you're talking about um, genealogy or DNA. 
And these are in the handout, and I don't know that you have the handout yet, but it will come with the recording. So the genealogy um, terminology, Family Search has some great, great sites um, and, and pages for genealogical terms. Also, abbreviated words are really important, especially if you're transcribing records and trying to keep that organized. And then, of course, ISOG is kind of the go-to for DNA and for DNA um, uh, acronyms, shortcuts, that sort of thing. So for citations, why do we use citations? Just in brief, um, it's a roadmap so we can find our way back but it's also a roadmap for the next person to find their way back. So part of your organization should be citing or noting where you found things. There are a lot of different ways you can do this. There are all kinds of books and websites about citations. But think about if you inherit a collection of things from your family, what is it that you'd want to know so that you could find your way back to where those documents came from? So I'll give you an example from my family. Uh, my great aunts, my grandmother's sisters, were in the DAR. They were big in genealogy. Neither one ever had children and they traveled a lot. And they traveled to Scotland and England and they did a lot of research in our family. When they passed away, most of that collection came either to my father or my father's siblings. And so over the years, I was struggling to kind of get all of it back together. But one thing that I really admired about what they did was they noted what archive they were in when they found things. And this is back long before the internet, long before anything we even had had thought about what an internet might be and so they're writing letters and they're going places and looking at documents and hiring professionals so those are the kinds of things that give us back information about where we found certain things that we were looking at in our family history and i was so grateful to them that they took the time to note where they were when they found things it made it so much easier for me to reconstruct there are some great explanations and guides about genealogy sourcing and citations, but the source is the record where we get our information. The citation is the link that connects the source to the conclusion. And by link, I don't necessarily mean a web link. I just mean it's the information that gets us back to where, to where the source information came from. There are lots of places where you can find what to cite. FamilySearch.org has some great information, but this is my basic list of what I add to, uh, to what I find in different archives. The author's name, the title, um, where I found it or where it was located. Um, a locator in terms of the library or archive call number. I put annotations in, so sometimes I'll give an explanation about the source, like maybe the cover was missing or the pages were fragile or some of it wasn't legible. So those kinds of things I kind of note. And then missing data, I'll make a note about that too. There's lots of great information online about citations. We're not going to spend much time on that. Because you know what we love. We love the find, we love the quest, we love the discovery but we need to embrace the organization that helps us progress. Otherwise, we're still finding the same things that we found five years ago. We wanna avoid accumulation without a plan. So whatever that looks like to you, if you're accumulating names and dates, if you're accumulating documents, think about how you want to organize them as you're accumulating them. It's gonna help you Think about your organization when you're researching. So if you're researching without organization, it's pretty costly and inefficient, especially if it's combined with research trips where you're spending a lot of time and effort and energy and money to go somewhere. And I'm sure as soon as this pandemic is calmed down, we're all gonna be itching to go somewhere, but you wanna be organized um, before you go. 
So to, moving ahead in an organized manner is one way you can approach this and then going back to organize, that's another whole project. And I've heard, uh, if you haven't heard Drew Smith, uh, he's one of the genealogy guys from the Genealogy Guy podcast. Drew Smith does a lot of talks on organization, and that's one thing that he stresses, that you should think about, don't think about the whole mountain of what you have, think about what you want to do moving forward. How is this going to change moving forward? And that'll help you make more bite-sized pieces out of it. So stop talking about what you're not. You know, self-talk is kind of a big deal. And we talk all the time about how we're not a historian or maybe we're not a writer. We can't write our family history. We're not a writer. We're not a researcher. Um, there are lots of things that people say. They're not good at keeping all these people straight. They have all these names that just repeat, repeat, repeat. I mean, we're used to that, right? So don't be concerned about what you're not. You might think that you're not a writer, but I will tell you some of the best things that I have, the best archives and relics that I have from my family were handwritten things that were poor grammar, poor spelling, <laughs> poor punctuation, and so on. But I could care less. I'm excited to have those pieces. So don't think about what you're not good at. Think about what you are good at. Sorry, I, I accidentally launched the poll there. We'll come back to that. There are solutions for all these things. If you're not a good writer, if you're not a good researcher, if you can't keep track of things, there are a lot of good solutions for those. So let's talk about how we can get a little bit more organized. Now my goal is mostly digital because my collection is mostly digital. So you might have different goals. But I know it sounds a little bit trite in some cases to set goals for your genealogy, but I set goals every year. What do I want to accomplish this year in my genealogy? And I don't do that in January. For some reason, like January 1st, I think a lot of people reevaluate and they make resolutions and all that. I actually set the goals for my genealogy on my birthday, and that's in June. So I just take a little bit of time on my birthday and I reflect, okay, what do I want to accomplish in the next year with my genealogy? So my goal was to build a portable, digital, accessible family tree. The reason I wanted to do that was, was many reasons actually why I wanted to do that. Because first of all, I have arthritis and my hands and my feet. And so it's really hard for me to carry a lot of things to an archive. It's, you know, carry a big trailer full of books and that sort of thing. It's just not easy for me to do. So I wanted something portable and digital and accessible. So I decided that I wanted to have an online tree, but I also wanted it to be on my local computer as well. So I didn't have to be on the internet to use it. Um, also, my goal was to publish. I wanted to publish something about my family. Now, publish is kind of a big word, and I, and I actually work in a professional world of publishing. I'm not talking about having someone purchase my manuscript or, or publish my manuscript. I'm just talking about me, Kelly, over here in the corner, makes something about my family, and then I hand it out to family or I take it to family reunion or I donate it to an archive. And I've done that every year. I've done that for the last five years. I've made something and I've donated it to an archive where my family was from. A uh, third goal that I had was to preserve for the future. Always. You know, I have many stories in my family where things were thrown away uh, someone didn't really care that much about it. Someone decided that they, um, that it wasn't necessary, that that information must be somewhere else. So why would I keep it? You know, my goal is to preserve for the future. And even if no one currently in the family is all that interested, I still have a preservation plan. And what am I going to do with that? And it's actually something that I keep in my firebox with my will. And it has instructions on how to distribute the things that I have, how to download the trees that I have online, and all that sort of thing. 
So set goals for how you want to organize. If you have those goals, it's going to help motivate you. So how do we get organized? We have to think about our workspace. Maybe it's about paper files and photos and documents. I know people who have just stacks and stacks of paper. Maybe your organization is more of a digital one and you're struggling with how do I organize on my computer? How do I back up my computer? And then also we have research trips. We'll eventually get back to research trips and how do we organize for that? So if you have a workspace, and this is, uh, I wish this was my entire organized workspace, but it's not. This is just, this is just one of the desks. Um, I'm sure that most of you can, uh, can understand that. I've expanded to a, a full room now that kids have moved on and I take over bedrooms one at a time. But I have notebooks, uh, three ring binders, and those are research notebooks. Um, I have clips and papers. Look at my big to-do pile there. It's even larger now. Um, and I have some maps and some storage buckets and things. So I have things fairly well organized here. Of course, you see there's no computer. I use a big dining room table for that. But think about your workspace and how could you be more efficient there? So what about papers and photos and documents? So let's talk about, I'm gonna um, launch a poll. Now, if you haven't done a poll before, uh, let's see, there we go. You should be able to see it on the screen. And so the question is, what kind of trees do you have? And you can choose any of those or all of those if you want. So we'll give everybody a couple seconds here to fill this out. Looks like about half of you are done. A few more. I don't know if you've seen the polling at the meetings, but it's kind of fun. Gives everybody a chance to say something. All right, looks like just about everybody's voted. So I'm gonna go ahead and end it and then share it so you guys can see. So what kind of trees do you have most? Let's see, it looks like most of you have digital online, but almost the same amount have paper. And some have software, just so, you know, software localized on your computer. So it looks like about a third of you might even have all three of those. So, so that's great. All right. I think the poll is gone, okay. So we're going to talk about something that I do that saves me a whole lot of time. Now, this may or may not work for you. Again, remember that my collection is primarily digital. Most of the things that I have that are paper are printouts. Um, I'm not talking about photos, just paper. So I don't have a lot of original documents. But what I do in, a, um, in the desktop is I have a folder that's called Attached. To family tree maker that's the software that I use I have a folder that's need to attach and then I have a folder that's called further research needed before attaching to family tree maker so that's something that I do on my desktop and I have those three folders so if I am researching something and let's say I find something on Google and I find a photo and I attach it to someone in my tree I put it in that folder attached to family tree maker if I find a photo, and let's say it's a common name in my family that's an unusual name, uh, Offenbecker. Um, so if I find an Offenbecker photo and I think, you know what, they're an Offenbecker from Ohio, so they're probably related to me, but I don't know how yet, <laughs> you know, it might go in the further research needed folder. And then if I have a lot of, of photos and I don't have time to attach them at the moment, I put them in that need to attach. So those just a three folder system that I use just to sort things so that they're not cluttered and in folders and buried somewhere. So those three are right on my desktop. For paper, I use filing bucket. Um, it's just like a regular bucket that you find at like Walmart or Target. And I use these ABC dividers and I just file everything by surname. 
Now you might think, okay, why would I file everything by surname? What about family groups and that sort of thing? And some people do file that way. Some people file in binders. Some people file things in um, according to family groups. So whatever works for you. But for me, because I realize that I'm not going to be digging around in those buckets all that much, unless there's something in particular I need to find, almost everything in there is attached to my family tree maker file anyway. So I just file according to last name. So for me, I was born Kelly Reed. So some of my earlier things are in the R's for Kelly Reed. And then my first husband, before he passed away, his last name was Washer. So I have Kelly Washer things that are in the W's. And then my second husband's name is Kelly Bergheim, or is Bergheimer. So I'm Kelly Bergheimer. So I have some things in the B's. So depending on which 20 year span of my life it was, I have records in different letters that go with surnames. Now for some people that doesn't work but that works for me. And most of these are things, like I said, that I'm not going back and looking for. So just something um, that I just want to organize a little bit, but on a macro level. I don't want to spend a lot of time doing file folders and all kinds of alternate names and married couples. I, I don't want to spend time on that. I'm going to attach everything to my family tree that's online and then if I need it, I can find it. So let me talk for a minute about file naming. So for, for JPEGs, they degrade a little bit every time you open them. So I have a, a set of photos that I've scanned and I don't ever open again. And then I have some that are the copies of those that I do open and close quite a bit. Um, so I, I have file naming. Um, we'll talk about the file naming convention in a minute. But for, for photos, I use acid-free boxes. I keep the photos in a temperature-controlled environment. And in Ohio in particular, we're worried about the flood, fire, water, tornado, you know, kind of problem. So it's something to think about um, in terms of humidity, what you want to do with your photos. I'm not an expert on photo storage or whether or not photos should be in albums or whether you should take them out of albums or any of that. Uh, Maureen Taylor is probably the best um, online genealogy photo guru that there is. And she's written a number of books about that. And she's also um, written a number of different web uh, articles and things like that about how you can preserve your photos, how you can date your photos. And if you ever get a chance to hear her speak in person, she's really fascinating when she does a talk. She's got lots of pictures and lots of clues. How can you figure out um, who is who in the photo? There are some things that I do with filing. You know, I do last name only. I don't sub alphabetize. I think that's a big time saver for me. And how often am I gonna look for that scrap of paper when it's attached to my family tree? So I'm thinking about it in terms of efficiency. If I had a lot of documents or old newspapers or something like that, I would be doing something different. I'm not just gonna throw those in a plastic bucket. So some common issues of filing, you know, sometimes they're legal sized paper um, and letter sized paper, scraps of paper. What about delicate paper? You know, the acid free boxes, I purchase a lot of those at the container store, but there are other places online that I'm sure sell them probably a little bit less expensive. The container store just has fancy ones. Um, but I don't have too many real live documents right now. My mom and dad still have those. And, and I deal with the issue of maiden names, married names, you know, by just filing with the last name that's on the document. So it might be a different stage of life. And I also have a whole section for unknown or unnamed. My, my U's are my, my biggest section in my filing. So I, one thing, if you're going to file name, 
settle on something and just keep reusing it and make yourself notes about it until you have it memorized. So I use underscore a lot because that underscore, it's like the key that's with the hyphen. I use that because it just helps the words kind of jump out at me. And your, your computer is fully searchable. So I don't spend a lot of time sub filing and building a lot of folders in my computer. There's no reason for it. If I want to search for, for William Calderwood, I can search for William Calderwood and my computer will tell me every single file that I have or photo or document that has William Calderwood. So I don't need to. I don't need to keep subfold, you know, subfolders. So I organize with family tree software. So this is what the screen looks like for family tree maker. And I really like the layout of it. And I like the fact that you can, you know, assign pictures and things like that. And you can also pretty quickly see your tree completeness. And you know, how many names do you have? How many blanks do you have? And, and uh, it's really easy to use this kind of software and attach things to it. So I spend a lot of time just attaching documents to my tree. There are a couple reasons why I do that. The first reason is because when I'm researching someone, or let's say I'm at an archive, and I wanna research John Wesley Reed, the first question would be which one because there are literally six I think generations where John Wesley and William Henry alternate in that top line of my family and so if I want to research John Wesley Reed sometimes I have to figure out which one and in doing that if I click on John Wesley Reed and I go to the media tab I can see all the things that I've attached for him so I'm not spending time looking for things that I already have the tree on your computer software can be the same as your Ancestry account. If you use Family Tree Maker software, it can be the same tree on your phone or your tablet. Really easy to use probably in all of those formats if you synchronize them and keep them uh, up to date. Um, I also um, synchronize it every time I open it just to make sure and most of the time it synchronizes as it's closing. Um, so I'm always just checking to make sure it's synchronized so that no matter which device I'm on I can see it and it's it is all up to date. And again the reason I use the software is because I can if I want to I can even view it on my phone. I can take it with me to an archive highly portable so that's really for me, the best reason. You can see the family groups here. I, I was reading in a, a Facebook group about organization today and yesterday, and they were talking about, do you need family group sheets um, and software? And you know, it's, most of the software actually gives you the family group sheets, so you don't necessarily need both. But what I like about um, Family Tree Maker, and I don't, I don't get paid to uh, promote them, but they're just one that I use. I really like the fact that it shows you a lot of things kind of at a glance. You can get an idea for locations pretty quickly. Um, if you look on the left side, um, Lucy Lacey is my second great grandmother, and there's a yellow arrow there because she's the one that I'm descendant from. So it gives me an idea of that. Um, you can also see here that Mary Riffle has two husbands. There's a little number two. And you can actually choose the ancestor husband. Um, you can choose the order of the spouses and that sort of thing. Because I don't know about you, but a lot of times I find myself being maybe the descendant of the second husband or the third husband even. I like to be able to view all the relationships, add media, change the profile pictures and that sort of thing. There's a notes field that I really like, but let's talk about how you can attach things. You can choose a person, you can open their profile and look for the media tab, and then you can upload. So let me show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, this is my second great grandfather, one of my second great grandfathers, William Henry Reed. And there are all kinds of things that I have attached to him. So if you look on the, on the right side, you'll see this is the media tab where all the attachments are. And I have a, 
a flag from the Civil War. This is a photo of a flag. I don't have the actual flag the, of the battalion that he was in in the Civil War. You know, I have family photos. I have the picture of where he went to school. Uh, he was a book binder in Columbus, Ohio. And so I have him listed as a book binder in um, the city directories year after year. I have the um, place where his office was located. It's pretty close to where the Columbus Dispatch is located today. And I have a picture of the uh, church where he was married. So I have a lot of different information attached about William Henry Reed. So if I go to an archive and I'm looking up information about him or want to to add something to this, at a glance, I can remember all the things that I have that are his. And it saves me an enormous amount of time. You know, the censuses, all the other things can be attached. So it's a great time saver. There's also a notes field that I use a lot. So, you know, I put where he's buried, um, where he voted, city directories, things like that, when he was in the Union um, Army for the Civil War. So I add notes. Um, one thing that I like about the notes is that if you actually do print from the software, you can choose whether or not you want to keep the notes in your printout. So that's a really handy thing to be able to just print all of that at once if you want to. So how do you organize for a research trip? I do a whole talk on this. Um, if you go to YouTube, I have a YouTube channel there and you can uh, listen to a recording about how to organize for a research trip. There is a lot in your handout about it um, that we're not going to get to tonight because it's probably its own hour and a half lecture. But, um, but there are a few things that I do to organize to get ready for a trip. And I'm doing those things whether I have the trip planned yet or not. Because I'm sure most of us, we have, maybe in our minds, we have a dream trip. I want to go to Scotland. I want to go to Germany or something like that. But I do research trip plans for even when I'm going to the library or my local library, or maybe I'm going to a little library in Champaign County, Ohio. So I'm always organizing for a trip and then trying to figure out when I have time to go. So before you go, think about how much time, effort, energy, money, uh, will you be able to go back again? You know, we'd all like to think that we have endless time to go to archives, but we don't. Um, so this is one thing that I'm always thinking about is if I only get one shot at this archive, how can I make the most of it? So I prepare by finding the genealogical or historical society or library or archive online to see what there's in their collection. And I check to see what's been done by the volunteers because normally that's featured right on the front page. Here's what we've been working on lately. Here's something new in our collection. So the front page can give you a lot of information. And of course you have local courthouses and other sites around wherever the archive or library is. And I organize in an electronic notebook that's called OneNote. And so if you haven't heard of OneNote, it's a Microsoft Office product. And if you have Microsoft Office, you already have it on your computer. You just probably haven't noticed it, but it's along with Word and Excel and PowerPoint, one of the default programs that comes with your computer. I order maps from the local county transportation departments. I use some notebooks for research. So I do have some things that are paper pencil. For me, that's the research notebooks that I have. And I use page protectors for maps and things like that. I have notebooks by county for Ohio. And then I have some that are by state for some other states in the country where my family came from. And in these notebooks, I just have this running list of what I looked at. Where was I? What did I find? What did I not find? Um, and I keep track of those, you know, positive and negative results, what I didn't find that I thought I might find. And I copy citation information there too. And so when I get home, I have something that I can transcribe, I can add notes to each person, but you know, I'm just kind of running stream of consciousness while I'm there. This is just a page from the local library, Columbus Library, where I live. And I was planning a trip to go to Logan County, Kentucky, 
to work on my hus first husband's family. And I knew that I was probably only going to get one shot at this archive um, to go there to find information. And I actually spent two days there and I walked in and behind the desk was one of my husband's cousins. I didn't know who she was at the time, but when I told her the names I was researching, she's like, oh, that's my family too. I mean, score, right? So I was so excited. And she even volunteered after work to drive me around to all the cemeteries to take pictures. She was a real gem. Don't always get that lucky, but when I'm planning a trip out of town, particularly if it's out of state, I go to my local library's webpage and I look to see what my local library has about a place, Logan County, Kentucky, because I'm thinking if there are 16 books in my local library about it, these are not books that I need to look at while I'm in Logan County, Kentucky. There isn't any point in me driving down there and staying for two days and paying money and that sort of thing to look at books that I can look at here in Columbus. So that's something that I do is I take the page from the, from the library, I print it, and I actually put these on my list of, I'm either gonna look at them before I leave or I'm gonna wait till I get back. So I'm not gonna spend time at the local library on these. I take those printouts with me. I also look at the collection that they have in Logan County, Kentucky, and then I make a list according to kind of my hit list of what are the top five things I wanna do. You know, I target because one of the things that I find myself doing, and I'm probably not alone in this, is when I'm at an archive, I get so excited by the books that I just want to go explore all the shelves and look through everything. And so I need to have like a real targeted list of here's what I really want to see these top three things or five things. And then I do allow myself time to browse, but I try to really limit that so that I don't lose track of what I was really there to do. So I go with a plan. I also, before I go, I just want to give you this kind of organizational tip. We have so many out of print books that are on Google Books or uh, Gutenberg or some of the other online sites and that you can read them ahead of time or you can keep them and read them when you get home. You don't actually have to read them while you're there. So we have county histories, centennial books, yearbooks, all those kinds of things. And I actually keep those on a reader. So I have an e-reader, um, I have a Nook, I have a Kindle, you know, and, and those, if, even if you don't have the devices, you could have the apps on your phone or you can have them on your laptop. But that way, the PDFs of the books, I used to print them. I mean, you know, back in the Stone Age, I used to print those PDFs and they're huge. And so now I don't need to do that. The other advantage to have the PDFs for out of print books is that they're searchable because you can just use on a Windows computer, you can use Control F. Control F is in Frank, and a window will pop up and you can type in a word or you can type in a name and it'll show you in the PDF where all those words are. And so even if there's no index, the PDF of the book is going to be so much more beneficial to you than the actual book where you have to read and read and read to find what you're looking for. So I don't spend time at the archives doing things what I can do at home or doing things what I can do in my local library, but that takes a little bit of planning. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about how to organize. I use an organizational tool for people who contact me, for cousins, for DNA matches, for scraps of paper, and I affectionately call it my, my cousin's notebook. So I use it for social media, for blogging, for finding a place to keep random bits of information. I just have this, um, I don't know, it's probably like a seven by nine kind of um, notebook. And when someone reaches out to me, let's say they send me a message on Ancestry. They say, hey, we're related. I, we are a DNA match, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm making notes all in one place. Eventually, those notes might become a project I work on with someone. It might be just a list of 10 different websites or webinars I want to watch. You know, it's just kind of one place to keep all those little sticky note kind of things. 
And so that's where I keep track of those first contacts when people reach out. I also have for emails what I call boilerplate language. Now, if you're not familiar with publishing, I've worked in publishing for about 30 years, and I have things that I copy and paste to save me a tremendous amount of time. So this is just one sample of boilerplate language that I use in email. So if I have, um, if I have DNA matches, I'll say, you and my father are second cousins according to our DNA testing. That means most likely we have common great-grandparents. Here are my great-grandparents' surnames, and I list them. Do you have any of these names in your family? So this is something that I copy and paste over and over and over into messages when I'm trying to reach out to my DNA matches. I will say that, you know, most of us are frustrated because people never respond back to us. And I get that, you know, I don't usually let that stop me from figuring out who they are. Um, but I use boilerplate language to really speed me up. And then someone can quickly look through this list and they'll say, they may come back and they'll say, oh yeah, I have a couple of those names in common. Let's work on that and see if that's where our connection is. And sometimes I'll have someone say, well, I'm adopted. I don't even know. And then we start from scratch from there. Or they don't correspond at all and then we just disregard. But I have a lot of things like this that I keep in Word documents that I just copy and paste into the messaging tools. And whether that's Ancestry or Family Tree or any of those kinds of 23andMe messaging tools, I use those all the time. I use those boilerplate things. In my cousin notebook, I have lots of other things. So I signed up for a lot of Roots Web's lists um, and digests. Those have now moved mostly to uh, groups.io, which is a different kind of format. Um, most of those web lists have expired just in the last couple of months, I think. Um, but I used to write down all the different web lists that I subscribe to. I also use an RSS feed, uh, feedly.com. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, I post my tree and I, you know, I look for people who have trees that have a lot of names in common with me because maybe they're an ancillary cousin or, you know, second, third cousin. And, you know, they don't know a lot about my particular branch. I don't know a lot about their particular branch, but I'm keeping track of that in my cousin notebook until I figure out, you know, how are we related? I keep a list there of the shared trees. So if you haven't used that feature, um, most of the tree software, family tree software has a share feature. And that way I don't have to keep updating people. So if I share my tree with them and then I make changes, they get an email that I've updated my tree. And so I don't have to keep remembering, oh, who did I share that with? Oh, what did I change? Oh, I should tell them. Uh, they get an email that I've made changes to my tree. Um, I also track websites, usernames, passwords, all kind of stuff. Who did I talk to? What was their tree name? You know, how did they get in contact with me? And I also track my genealogy society memberships because they all have just different expiration dates, different fees, and it just helps keep me organized. Everything's kind of all in one place. And I belong to a lot of different societies in that span between Columbus and Indiana. So there are a lot of places I'm trying to keep track of. Also, you might want to consider an electronic notebook. Now, if you haven't used something like OneNote or Evernote, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of it. I teach a lot of workshops in OneNote. I love it. I use it for just about everything, and I've used it for 17 years. It is a great organizational tool. And for me, especially, I wanted something, again, accessible. I wanted to be able to take it with me wherever I went without carrying crates full of notebooks. So let me show you. Um, I'll, I'll just explain a little bit about it. It mimics a regular notebook, but it's digital. And you can draw in it, type in it, write in it. Um, you can collect up things there. Instead of printing, you can send things to it. Um, it's actually fully searchable. So I use it for all kinds of things, uh, for work. I use it for recipes, uh, grocery lists, you name it. I've got it in OneNote. And I've been using it, as I said, 17 years. And it, 
it doesn't have any um, signs of being anywhere near maxed out. I just keep adding and adding and adding to it. So my notebook is what's the regular notebook and then there are tabs or sections that are like dividers and then there are pages that are like paper in a notebook. And you can store things, um, it stores in the cloud um, for OneDrive and you can also download the file if you want to, but you don't have to. Here's kind of a visual of what it looks like. I use this all the time. I use this for webinars. I use it for conferences. I load the syllabus and then I take notes along with the syllabus or I do screenshots along with the syllabus. Um, it was invented in 2003 for use at schools. And I did use it uh, when I was, well, I was a teacher before 2003, but in 2003, I was homeschooling uh, my children for a few years when they were in middle school. And so when they were in six, seven, eight, I was homeschooling and that was back in the days of those $30 teeny tiny ink cartridges. And I was spending a fortune having them print all this stuff for school. And I searched until I found a solution for that. And we used OneNote for school. And that's what Microsoft actually um, started it for. There is a companion kind of complementary looking uh, program online called Evernote. Um, but Evernote, there are some fees associated. I like the fact that OneNote is free and already on your computer. And if it's not on your computer, it's a free download. So I like that a lot. Um, this is kind of what it looks like um, with the note, name of the notebook and then the folder and then the page. And then at the right, if I had enough room on the screen, you'd be able to see the full conference um, PDF from FGS. So if you've been to the Federation of Genealogical Societies conference, this was the 2018 syllabus and it's in there and all I have to do is is search it or read it from there and it's fantastic. So no more little thumb drives all over the desk. They're all in one place. Um, and this is what it looks like um, on uh, the iPad. This is what it looks like and you can see all the different folders. I have folders for Ohio Maps, genealogical templates, how-tos, you know, in the news, that sort of thing. Um, I use it for DNA results. So I have some results from early, early testing of my dad. Um, I have information and reports, different uh, families that I'm working on, different lines that I'm researching. So each of these are pages. And in case you're wondering, the page isn't just like eight and a half by 11. It's almost like if you think of it as infinitely long, it's pretty cool. I use it for syllabi from conferences, DNA tracking of matches, uh, cousin information, note taking, research. You can add all kinds of things to it. You can add photos, notes. It has the ability for audio, video, a number of different things that you can add. One thing that I do with it in particular with organizing photos is I might be scanning photos. Um, I've done this with all kinds of cousins. You know, my, my family has 190 years almost of Ohio family. And so I have cousins everywhere. And so I go house to house and I might scan the photos that they have. And while I'm doing that and I put them in one note, I'm asking them, whoever's there with me to tell me about. What do you know about that? What do you know about this person? Where was this photo taken? You know, so I'm recording that audio along with scanning the photos. So I'm able to capture so much more by using a tool like OneNote. Um, I also have um, notebooks for surnames, for clients, for family groups, for DNA projects. It's fully searchable and you can organize it however you want. So however your brain works, you can do it. Can you tell I love OneNote? <laughs> All right, so you can also use what's called an aggregator. And I mentioned Feedly earlier and I didn't talk um, too much about it except to say that we're going to talk about it later. But Feedly is what's called an aggregator. So if you're not familiar with that, 
an aggregator compiles things. It compiles news or web updates, website updates, blog posts, podcasts, those kinds of things until you're ready to read it. So it keeps everything in one place. Feedly is an online free site. It's just feedly.com. You can sign up with an email and password. There's no other cost to it. And then you can have it start compiling things for you. And it's pretty awesome because you can wait until you're ready to read things. So if you think about it in terms of what are you doing now, if you think about I'm going to Ancestry's message boards and I'm going to blogs and I'm going to conference blogs and websites and maybe I want to check my library and then I want to check um, Judy Russell and then I want to check you know Dick Eastman and then I want to check Thomas McKenty or whoever it is you're checking. Think about all the hundreds of things that you have to check. An aggregator actually does the opposite of this because what I'm doing is I'm reaching out to all those different places but an aggravator does the uh, ag aggr aggravator, sorry. Aggregator does the opposite. It takes all of those things and brings them to you. So that anytime there's an update to a website, it accumulates in Feedly. And then you can very quickly look through and say, okay, I care about this, I don't, I care about this, I don't. Um, and just, just to give you an idea, if you put Judy Russell's website in there, every time Judy Russell does a new post, it shows up in Feedly. And then you can decide, okay, well, I care about this one from the War of 1812. I don't care about this one from the New Jersey archives, you know, and so you can make your decisions very quickly. It's like reading headlines. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is the Family Search blog. Um, in Feedly and so you can just quickly look through here and say you know what this I care about this I don't this I care about this I don't and it's a quick way to check hundreds of websites just in an hour you know when you want to not necessarily when you're plugged into your computer and when you're searching online and all the other bookmarks and things that you might be doing now um, also the surname boards. Ancestry has surname boards and just recently these I've been starting to have trouble with the links. I think there's something about the Roots um, web and some of the other uh, feeds that aren't working properly but I used to subscribe to these surname boards. I had 146 of my surnames in here so that I could quickly look through and say well this is the Cooper one and or any of these ones that I care about. And it was just a quicker way to do all those surname boards. I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a workaround to see if I can still get to it. But right now when I click on each link, it's not sending me where I think it should. But that was one way that I used Feedly a lot was the surname boards. So what are the most important things? We're gonna end with this tonight because if you're not backing up and preserving and or donating what you have or what you find, who's going to see it? You know, what's the point of doing all of this research, all of this accumulating, all of this knowledge that you have if nobody sees it? So think about how are you going to back up digitally? Now I use an external hard drive system. Now some of you might have an external hard drive that's right on your desk and folders go to there or you have things stored there. The only problem with the one that's right on your desk is if something happens to your computer and happens to your desk, both of those are gonna be destroyed. So I use um, external hard drives. I have two of them that I use and I am always swapping them back and forth like every month or two. I'll take one to my mom's house and I just stick it in a drawer at her house and then a couple months later, I'll bring a new one and I'll swap it out. You can do that with a genealogy buddy. You can do that with a friend. Um, but I figure if there's a huge tornado or storm or flood at my house, it's not likely to be, you know, 20 minutes from here at my mom's house. So it's just something that I do to kind of give myself an extra bit of security that I have those files saved. Um, you can do online backup. There are plenty of things, um, Carbonite, and there's some other online backup um, tools that you can use. iDrive is another. 
Um, you can upload your tree to Ancestry. So if it's synchronizing between your computer and online, of course, that gives you a backup because it's online. Um, you want to have redundancy. You want to have things in multiple places, not just one. I mean, it's horrible when I read, you know, that someone had lost their entire collection or all of their photos or, you know, anything like that. And think about that too with your phones, um, that you have cloud storage for your photos on your phone. So if your phone drops in a puddle of water, you don't lose all your pictures. And use the buddy system, use your genealogy buddy and, and pass things back and forth between. Um, you can find your family tree file um, and you can save it to an external hard drive. Um, you can save your OneNote notebooks. There's all kinds of things that you can save to your external hard drive from different places in your, um, in your regular computer files. Just drag them to the external drive. Dragging them to an external drive just copies them. It doesn't remove them. The difference um, for that, the one exception to that is Dropbox. If you use Dropbox and you drag something to Dropbox, it almost always removes it from your computer and moves it to Dropbox. So just be careful with, with that. But Dropbox is another great option. Think about how you wanna plan for your future of your information. Who has your passwords? Who has your account information? Who will care for your archives of papers and photos? What do you want to happen to those? I mentioned earlier that I have everything written out about where I want things to go. I have boxes already labeled. This goes to Champaign County. This goes to Dark County. This goes to Shelby County. And what I've started doing actually, even though I consider myself to be pretty young, I'm donating things now. I'm not waiting until someone else has to deal with that. I'm donating things now. So I donate to the local archive. Um, I donated a family Bible. I've donated other kinds of documents and things to a local archive. I donate to a number of societies where my family settled for a long, long time and in some cases still are there. If you don't have a place that you want to donate or can find to donate, Allen County Public Library in Indiana will literally take anything. Um, they will take digital donations, they will take paper donations, and if you donate to their library, I have a book that I compiled from a trip that my family took from Greenville, Ohio in Dark County all the way to California in 1927. Six grown adults in one car in 1927, driving across the desert and whatnot to California. Then they went up the coast and then they came back the northern route through the Dakotas and Chicago and back down to Ohio. So I transcribed diaries and journals and added maps. And when I finished with that, I donated it to the Dark County um, Historical Society, the Garst Museum. I also donated it to the Allen County Public Library. And what they did was they put a binding on it and they put it on their shelf and they added it to their card catalog. So if you wanna see your name in a card catalog as a writer or author or, um, or someone who donated family history, if you've not been to the Allen County Public Library, you are missing out. That place is amazing. And their family history room of, of compiled family histories is just enormous. So maybe you wanna do something where your book is gonna be there as well. Um, and this is the picture of the book. It's kind of a fuzzy picture, but the trip that my, my grandparents and my great grandparents and a couple siblings, six adults took to, uh, from Ohio to California in 1927. So what would you rather be doing? Would you rather be filing or would you rather be doing more research, more publishing, more sharing, or collaborating? I'm sure I know the answer to that. You know, we all have limited time, so prioritize what you're doing. Prioritize so that you can maximize your fun time. You're not rediscovering and retreading where you already were. So time spent planning and preparing will pay off, I promise. So I'm gonna stop the recording so that um, we can see if there are any questions and that way people don't feel like they're on the spot.
So let me stop the recording.